Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar on Digital Humanities, a reshaping of the humanities in the fourth industrial revolution. This afternoon, we are going to present to you a different way of processing data from the humanities. And this webinar is presented as a collaboration between the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, the CSIR, and UNISA. So both UNISA and the CSIR are nodes of SADILAR. My name is Karen Kalto. I am from the CSIR. We will have four presenters this afternoon. Professor Menno van Zonen, who is Professor in Digital Humanities at SADILAR. Mr. Juan Stein, a Project Manager at SADILAR. And Professor Zonja Bosch, Professor in African Languages at UNISA. I'm now going to hand over to Professor van Zonen to give a short introduction into digital humanities in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Okay, so this webinar is about humanities and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, so let's have a look at what this Fourth Industrial Revolution now really is. And according to the World Economic Forum website, uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution represents a fundamental change in the way we live, work, and relate to one another. It's a new chapter in human development enabled by extraordinary technology advances uh, commensurate with those of the first, second, and third industrial revolutions. Uh, okay, so this might not actually uh, say too much, but if we actually look at the first uh, three industrial revolutions, we see that the first industrial revolution, which is typically called the industrial revolution, uh, has a particular source that enabled uh, things to happen. And that source for the first one is steam power. And the effect of that is that uh, mass production could start. The second industrial revolution, typically called the technical, uh, revolution had as a source electricity and that uh, as, as an effect it had globalization. The third industrial revolution is called the digital revolution and the, the source there is processing power and the internet in a way and that led to uh, global interconnectedness. Now the question is if we're in, the in this fourth industrial revolution what exactly is the source and what is this effect? Um, okay so this fourth industrial revolution uh, as the, the quote from the, uh, the website said, is a fundamental change in how we live, work and relate to, or perhaps communicate with one another. Uh, it's a new chapter in human development, enabled by extra extraordinary technology. Um, so it leads to enhanced or improved communication, which is then the fundamental change, and it allows for further human development uh, using computational means, so it's a, a sense of technology. Uh, if we now look at this computational communication, uh, computational tools actually help with this communication. And we see that these are rising. Some of these are already available. Uh, things like spell checkers, speech recognition, or machine translation. Uh, they're already available, uh, but then again, the quality is not always perfect. Improvements are still possible. Um, but if you want to develop these tools, and if you want to improve these tools, you need to train them. Uh, you need to train them by giving them linguistic examples. Okay, so if we need this digital language data to train these tools, where do we get this? Well, actually, what you see now, and this is a relatively recent development, a lot of these linguistic information, this language information, language data, is available, is shared on social networks. Um, and these social network ha networks have a range of uh, languages. Uh, it actually shows actual lang language use, how people use language to communicate, uh, and you can find it in, in larger, huge amounts. Uh, additionally, it provides not just language use, but it also gives uh, cultural information. How do people communicate uh, with, each other, with each other? What can you do uh, in this communication? And that information as well allows the computer, if we put it inside a computer, to learn about uh, cultural norms. Okay, so if that is the case, then this fourth industrial revolution could be seen as a social revolution. So the source is then this kind of shared linguistic or human information that you can find on social media networks, for example. And uh, the effect, if we do this properly, is uh, information, accessible information on, on human nature. Now, if we can capture this information and use that in these computational linguistic tools, then, then this is actually something that allows for the development of uh, a fundamental change in the way we live, work, and communicate with each other. Uh, it will be a new chapter in, in human development, 
uh, enhanced communication in a way. And this is uh, enabled by this extraordinary uh, technology. As Karin mentioned, it all starts with data. One of the key elements of the fourth industrial revolution is the availability of digital accessible data sets and technologies to process it, as well as new and innovative ways to access existing as well as gather new data from analog and raw digital sources. But we also live in a paradoxical time where there's on the one side an explosion of tools and data, but on the other side, the lack thereof and scarcity. One area where this is in particular true is within the, the domain of languages, with all our official languages, um, except English, being classified as under-resourced. There's also an overall need for reskilling, it seems, given that a lot of the practitioners in the field have not yet been trained in some of these new methodologies and tools since they are new. Looking at what we do at the South African Center for Digital Language Resources that forms part of the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap, we provide a space to ensure that the long-term preservation of existing and new data sets can be disseminated, as well as we support and actively work towards the creation of new data sets and tools. All of these tools and resources are hosted on, on our platform and is available for research use. But more importantly, they fulfill the role of building blocks that provide access to downstream user-facing applications and that support the translational impact of research. One specific area that I would like to touch on when we look at the collection of data is the term of crowdsourcing. Some of you might be more familiar with crowdsourcing within the funding domain, such as Kickstarter, GoFundMe, and Patreon. But how does this look in the research space? And what value could be added within the South African context where there's a big scarcity in terms of tools and certain language resources? So one area where value can definitely be added within the space of crowdsourcing relates to focused participatory research and ethical co-creation of data sets and tools. This space provides communities with more agency to form part of the data collection process as well as the tool creation process. Given this new approach, there are a few things that we might need to rethink going forward, such as research copyright, as well as existing attribution practices. Now, moving a little bit to show and tell. The first, a local example. This example, called Sprach Atlas, was developed by the Virtual Institute for Afrikaans. And this platform provides users with the possibility to record a fable of Aesop called The North Wind and the Sun. What makes this interesting in Afrikaans, the recording or the narration of that particular fable allows researchers to do very specific phonology research. But for users using the platform, they can also see how different parts of the country speak different dialects and of Afrikaans and sound different from one another. There's an example of some of the basic metadata that's captured in a platform like this. And it provides an insight into how research and the community can come together in a specific platform. Another international example that we can look at is a platform called Language Arc that provides for crowdsourcing of certain materials. This platform was developed by the Linguistic Data Consortium, a structure similar to the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, based in the US and focused on the US. In this platform, users can create small applications that can collect very specific data and do certain types of post-processing as well. One of these platforms is called Language Arc, and it has been developed by the Linguistic Data Consortium of the United States. This consortium is similar to the South African Center for Digital Language Resources. Language Arc platform provides users with the ability to create small applications that can collect data and do certain post-processing. The three examples that you can see on the screen, the one focuses on speech biomarkers, the one focuses on language and the autistic spectrum disorder, and the last one is an application that can be used to build up communicative inventories for children in South Africa. Looking close at one particular example, the speech biomarkers application is a good example of how big data, research, and the public humanities can get together and do something interesting. This particular application will provide users with the ability to monitor their own cognitive processes over time and see how specific life choices, medical intervention, or just the passing of time can influence cognitive health. But also with applications like this, 
the critical word is big data. You need enough participants to really make specific um, judgments. Looking more now towards the digital humanities space, a very good country-wide digital humanities project was launched in Ireland in 2013. And this particular project was called the Letters of 1916 to 1923, Ordinary Lives, Extraordinary Times. This particular project was launched countrywide and it allowed for researchers and the public broadly to understand a little bit better how things were more than 100 years ago and also showed how interconnected lives were back then. More than 2,000 transcribers took part in this project, most of them not from the academic setting. There's different ways that users and researchers can interact with the collection. The first part is to discover what is available there, browsing through the collection, drilling down into very specific parts of the collection. People can get involved as transcribers, as all of these letters were written by hand, and it is very difficult to build specific processes to do handwritten text recognition, and therefore, the involvement of the broader public helps to unlock these resources. So it really allows for active participation in research by the general public. And then the last bit is if you have collections, you can actually deposit some of the letters that you might have with your family, or if you're an institute with letters, you can deposit that as well. And to date, more than 60 families has contributed to this project, as well as 40 institutes. In terms of gamification, what they also did here, they allowed uh, for what they call digital treasure hunts to take place, where different users could go into the platform and search for specific things until they find it. And what's interesting about this is this platform really allows for school children, for instance, to learn a little bit more about their heritage. And it shows how the convergence of all of these different technologies can be used to actually do something that benefits society as a whole, and it's not just a research project. One of the questions that leaves this for us is, how can we do something like this for South Africa? What topics might we think of? And how could we garner more support for the broader public to engage in these type of projects? So looking forward for South Africa, there's three questions that I think comes up that we must think of in the time that will come. The first one is to think about what infrastructure or what additional infrastructure is needed to support the collection, curation, and the distribution of data in the country. Second one, how can we open up the space beyond academia and industry for the general public to also engage in research and research outputs? How can we drum up that participation? And then the last question is, what type of support is needed in terms of reskilling and upskilling of the public as well as the research sector? And that is one of the key aspects that Sutler as a research infrastructure, part of the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap, aims to achieve to do their part to address these type of questions going forward. So this part is on uh, data enables research, uh, and we're going to look at uh, social network identification. Okay, so this research that I'm going to uh, quickly talk about uh, stems from uh, collaborative research with uh, Inge van der Ven from uh, Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And she was really interested in uh, close reading and distant reading. So close reading, uh, is a, a really thoughtful kind of focused analysis of pieces of text. So you can analyze small amounts of data, which you can uh, have a very focused, um, uh, concentrated analysis of the, these texts. This is in contrast to what's called distant reading, where the, uh, the reading uh, actually relies on computer programs to analyze these texts. The advantage of that is that the computer doesn't really get tired, so you can analyze large or huge amounts uh, of data. And what you then get is from these huge amounts of data, you get a general kind of high level pattern that occurs in this text. Now this, um, this close and distant reading, they're typically seen as a kind of extremes. You can either do close reading or you can do distant reading and, and not something in between. And the research that, that we did here was actually trying to see, can we find some, some tools that, that, that help this close reading by doing some distant reading. So we're trying to see this as a scale and find research that can happen in between close and distant reading. So bridging the gap between close and distant reading. Okay, so what we did is we tried to, tried to develop a system that can automatically identify social networks that occur in text. Um, so if you read a book, uh, books are typically about characters, the main characters on the book. Uh, 
uh, and they interact with each other. So there is some sort of social network that is described in this book, and we want to automatically extract this so we can do this from large amounts of text, and with the idea that this can help with the uh, close reading and analysis of the same text. So what we did is we tried to identify uh, characters or people in a text, and um, and then try to find this, this social network that occurs within the text. So to do this, we first applied the named entity recognizer. And the named entity recognizer is a tool that identifies names of characters and animals, etc., in a text. So once that is done, we still need to figure out how do these people communicate or interact, which people communicate and interact. So what we assumed here is that if two named entities or two names of, of characters occur together in a sentence, they have some sort of relationship. We don't know what kind of relationship, but there is some sort of relationship. And we analyze the full text, we count these occurrences, and based on that, we can create a social network and we can visualize that network. We, we can actually look at that, at that network. So the first example, so the first text we took was uh, White Teeth from Zadie Smith. Uh, and this is about two North London families, and Archie uh, and Samad are the main characters, characters in the book. And there also there's a whole range of, uh, of family members as well. So if we try to identify these names in the text, try to find the, the relationships between these characters and visualize this in a network, you get something like this, um, which is really nice, but uh, there's so much chaos there, it doesn't really seem to, to help. But if we zoom in a little bit, and if we zoom in a little bit more, we actually see that the, the strongest relationship that this automatic um, approach, this automatic tool found, uh, is actually between the two main characters. And the other names that have relatively strong relationships between these characters are actually family members. So this actually helps with the uh, close reading analysis, or this is the result from the distant reading analysis. Okay, so that's all really nice if you can do this for English text. But what happens if you apply it to South African text? So we're now moving this research into the South African context. So the interesting thing is that English has a wide range of available tools that allows the identification of named entities, so the main characters in a book. Um, and these tools actually exist for the South African languages as well, but there is actually quite limited availability. The quality is not particularly high, uh, and that is mostly because uh, of the limited amounts of training data. So we need to have training data to, to get these tools to improve the quality of these tools. However, the, the way this approach works uh, is that we might actually get useful information already because the amount of occurrences of the main characters in the, in the text. So let's see if we can actually do this. And we've done this for three uh, languages, for Afrikaans, for Chivenda and for Xitsonga. So we've taken the same approach, try to identify the named entities, so the main characters in the book, try to find the relationships between these characters, and then visualize the network. And then you get these networks. So for Afrikaans, this is a network, so this actually seems to work. For Chivenda, I can't actually read this, uh, so I have no clue whether this is correct or not, but my colleague who's um, been working on this as well, who does speak Chivenda, said that this is actually a good representation of that book. And the same holds for Xitsonga. We can actually get nice networks describing the relationships between the people uh, in the books. Okay, so why can we? Why are we developing this, and how can we then use this? Well, we've been trying out these tools on uh, on novels and on plays to see can we actually do this. But you can also apply this to different kinds of books. So, for example, you can apply you can apply to history books. And that means that you can find out the social networks of the characters of the people who are described in these history books. Um, by doing that, you can get an idea of which people communicated and what kind of power relations existed um, between these people. And what might be more interesting is if you apply this to different history books, you might see different viewpoints on how people then think these, these people in history communicated and interacted. So will different languages, uh, so history books in different languages, will these lead to different social networks of historical people or written in, uh, in different time periods? Does our view of history change over time? And this com computational analysis may uncover not only 
the um, um, relationships that we might already know, but it might actually uncover additional relationships that we, we never even realized existed. Uh, something else that you could do with these kind of uh, analyses is uh, analyze more literature. And what you could perhaps do is analyze or identify different writing styles. So different authors have different writing styles. Can you identify this in these networks? Or perhaps different cultural aspects. Uh, do different people uh, communicate or relate to each other in a different way? You could perhaps also measure text complexity. Will difficult texts have difficult or more complex social networks? So that's all I wanted to say on, on this part. The focus in this presentation is the African WordNet as an example of digital humanities-based research and development. Within the context of the recently held UNESCO International Conference on Language Technologies for All, I quote, information and knowledge in different languages is key to the achievement of sustainable development. The production of new knowledge and adequate responses to emerging challenges such as poverty, climate change, the digital divide, uneven economic opportunities and social exclusion will require the preservation of knowledge accumulated in local traditions and practices through appropriate tools. We will demonstrate how a so-called WordNet, a large digital lexical database, can be used as repository for the documentation and preservation of indigenous knowledge. So what is a WordNet? It is not an online dictionary, but rather a semantic dictionary that is designed as a network. Such an interrelated system representing words and concepts seems to be consistent with evidence for the way speakers organize their mental lexicons, as described by Fellbaum, 1998, the co-developer of the English Princeton WordNet. A WordNet can be imagined as a description of words and concepts of a language that are hierarchically and semantically organized in electronic format. It consists of synonyms called synsets. These are groupings of synonymous words expressing the same concept. Synsets are linked by conceptual semantic and lexical relations. An example of a synset is automobile, car and motor car, all expressing the same concept. Synsets are also interrelated by means of semantic relations such as superordinate and subordinate also known as hyperonym and hyponym in linguistic terms. In this example, the superordinate would be automotive vehicle, while the subordinates of car or motor car are Model T, SUV, convertible and coupe, to mention a few. Another typical semantic relation is a part whole or meronymy relation. In this case, concepts expressing parts of a car would be bumper, windscreen, car door, etc. Verbs and adjectives may include relations of oppositeness or antonymy, such as open, close and big, small. WordNets also usually include definitions and usage examples, as seen on the right-hand side of the graph. There are word nets for hundreds of languages in the world. Some have reached an advanced stage of completion. A case in point is the English Princeton word net with more than 250,000 synsets. Some languages even have more than one word net, for example, the Polish and French word nets, while others are still under construction. There are monolingual as well as multilingual word nets the Open Multilingual WordNet project, for example, has collected details for more than 200 of these and aims to make the various WordNets which were developed under open licenses accessible via a central browser and to link the different languages to each other. We focus on the Multilingual African WordNet project, which deals with a large-scale, freely available lexical database of the nine official African languages in South Africa. The individual language 
WordNets are in various phases of development, but they are all linked via the Princeton English WordNet. The African WordNet project resorts under the UNISA African Languages node of SADILA, the main aim of which is language development. The digital revolution has had a considerable impact on the construction of the African WordNet, among others, since it is possible to cover extensive information on aspects of word meaning that are not easily covered in traditional print dictionaries. The reason is that electronic or digital databases are generally not adversely affected by space, size or even time constraint, as is the case with printed matter. They therefore lend themselves ideally to the inclusion of additional data, such as indigenous knowledge, that is often underrepresented in conventional dictionaries. Indigenous knowledge that is dispersed across a variety of sources, such as mono and bilingual dictionaries, interdisciplinary sources including anthropology publications, diverse cultural publications, and a flat structured online database was collected for incorporation in the African WordNet. We demonstrate by means of a sample based on traditional Zulu pottery, in particular traditional clay beer pots, how this information can be organized into a set of relations within the context of a hierarchical WordNet structure. Such a living digital knowledge database has almost no physical restrictions. Here we illustrate a typical lexical gap that appears in the WordNet of the English source language and which can be filled by information from indigenous knowledge systems. There are three subordinates or hyponyms listed for clayware, namely Wedgwood, Agateware and Lusterware. None of these makes provision for the traditional pottery, not baked in a kiln but fired in a small depression in the ground, as found in Zulu culture and described as such by Grosset 1985. This leaves a lexical gap that needs to be filled in the Isizulu word net. Therefore, a fourth subordinate or hyponym relation, traditional pottery, or izimpahla ezibunjwe ngebumba, is required. Following this brief overview of possible disparities between the English source language and the Isi Zulu target language, in particular regarding indigenous traditions and practices, we outline the cyclical pattern the collection and representation of indigenous knowledge in WordNet synsets follows. Identification of lexical gaps is followed by iteration of data collected from various sources, consultation with language experts, and visualization of the semantic relations in the hierarchical structure as captured in one of the WordNet editors, in this case the WordNet Loom editor. Research reveals that four distinct types of Zulu beer vessels can be distinguished according to volume and function, namely Imbiza for storage and brewing of beer, Upiso for transporting beer, Ukamba for serving beer and Umangnishana for serving beer to particular guests. A comparison of various descriptions of beer vessels in dictionaries and other resources led to the identification of subcategories of four distinct types. These are represented in the Isizulu part of the African WordNet as illustrated here in this graph. The resulting hierarchical classification of beer vessels in relation to traditional pottery is visually represented in this graph. Attributes of the particular synset are displayed in the sub-panels on the right of the graph. Going a step further, our ultimate aim is to include images of indigenous knowledge concepts, such as, for instance, traditional clayware, in order to make this a truly comprehensive database for the future. Although a WordNet is accessible to human users via web browsers or editors, the primary use is in automatic text analysis and artificial intelligence applications. 
including word sense disambiguation, information retrieval and machine translation. WordNets are therefore fundamental language resource components for natural language processing in the context of the fourth industrial revolution and can be used not only to preserve language specific vocabularies around socio-cultural topics but also to transfer such indigenous knowledge between languages. The multilingual African WordNet lends itself ideally to such transferability between various African languages and is foreseen as future work. Thank you. The last six months have shown us how rapidly our world can change and is changing. Within the last few months, we have seen the emergence of online learning platforms, online meeting platforms, digital analytics platforms, and things that we didn't really know before, and yet we have adapted. What was striking about this pandemic is the way in which social media platforms, the interconnectedness of us all, helped to disseminate information about the pandemic. The last six months have shown us some good things, the, way, the fact that we can adjust and adapt quickly, but it's also shown us some potentially bad things, such as the fact that the digital divide could actually become even greater than what it is at present. Paradoxically, technology is also the solution to these challenges and the only way to ensure a higher level of social inclusion. This reality is already reflected in the national policy documents of our country, such as the National Development Plan and the National Integrated ICT Policy. The ICT policy has as a vision a people-centered, development-oriented, inclusive digital society. And it contains a few objectives which resonate with what language technologies can do. The first is to enable equity or equitable access to information for all. The second is to enable accessibility. In other words, services and content must be accessible to persons uh, to everybody, including persons with disabilities. And the third is contributing to an improved quality of life for all. South Africa has a very diverse population with 11 official languages and different levels of literacy. Language is a crucial part of information exchange. In order to produce a truly equitable society where information exchange benefits all of its members, it's vital that language and accessibility barriers are addressed. Such barriers occur in direct interaction between people and in how people access information that is widely available. Language barriers, however, exacerbate some of the socio-economic barriers that we have in the country. But fortunately, language technology applications can help to address some of these barriers, in fact, both types of barriers. In this presentation, I'll be showing two implementations of language technology that can bear testimony to this. CSIR has been focusing on localized language technology development since 2003, with the aim of bringing our local languages into the digital age. Spoken language technologies are broadly categorized in terms of two main sets of type technologies. The one is speech recognition, um, commonly known as speech to text, where a, sp a speech signal is converted into a text stream. The other technology is the reverse, where a computer takes a text stream and converts it into audio, which hopes to be or which aims to be as natural as possible. Speech technology development is about applying machine learning techniques to process human language. But we all know that modern day cutting edge machine learning techniques are very data hungry. And from there comes the science and engineering question that we have been responding to at CSIR. Namely, how do we develop high quality speech technologies on a par with what is available internationally, but working within a resource scarce environment? Both speech to text and text to speech have immense value as assistive technologies, particularly for the print disabled community, but they also have equal value in mainstream applications, such as reading on the go or personalized services 
uh, or augmented ebooks for that matter. So I want to focus on two implementations, two recent implementations of, of language technology. The one is around an accessible multilingual M government service application. And that was based on the technology of speech to speech translation. The second pertains to digital transformation within the publishing industry. And the implementation there was around augmented ebooks. So on this graph, you can see um, uh, exposition of a typical speech to speech translation system. It consists of an ASR engine, <coughs> speech recognition engine, which is able to ingest speech in, out in language one and turn that speech into text. Then that text is then sent to a machine translation engine to translate it from language one into language two. And the second language, the L2 text, is then sent to a text-to-speech engine to audify it, to change it from a text string into audio and output as audio. The application we worked on is called Aweza Med. Aweza Med is an Android-based mobile speech-to-speech -speech translation application, which serves as a communication tool to be used between healthcare provider, providers and patients to enable communication. We built two versions of Awezamed. The initial implementation was for English, Afrikaans, Isisulu, and Isitosa, and it was designed for the midwifery and obstetrics domain. The second version, the COVID-9 version, modified some of the content of the first version to enable it to be applicable to COVID-19 screening and triage situations. And this is available in all 11 official languages. Later in the webinar, there will be a video which uh, provides a bit more detail on the Always Ahmed application. Of course, no application is developed without a research component. In this project, we needed to focus on developing robust speech to text systems that produce high quality speech recognition and very accurate speech recognition under noisy conditions, as you could expect in a clinic or a hospital. We also needed to make sure that the application had a natural language understanding uh, component so that uh, a user would be able to use a variable input to search for phrases. The machine translation had to be highly accurate. One cannot take a chance in the medical domain to have incorrect translations. And lastly, we worked on making the text to speech sound as natural as possible because the application was targeting persons who had most likely not encountered this technology before. So in this slide, you can see some screenshots of the Aweza Med application. At the top, you can see that you're able to choose the language um, input or the translation, the language into which the content will be translated. Um, you can see that there are phrases and a translate button that you use to translate the phrase into the language that you've selected. And then there is a play button that you use to output the text into audio. There is also the possibility to favorite an utterance so that one can build up a bit of a dialogue according to your needs. On the most right hand screen, you can see that there are green text boxes. These pre represent variable input and can be used then to generate multiple utterances using very little space on the application screen itself. The second implementation I want to quickly talk about is what we call Q-Frency eBooks. This is a good example where mainstream and assistive technologies are starting to converge. It is built on the same foundational technologies of speech to text and text to speech, and it's, an, it's enabling us to provide unprecedented access and incentives for many types of non-readers to become readers. Q-Frency eBooks is a modular system. Uh, it consists of a converter that converts any input uh, document in, for, say, a PDF or a DOCX into an EPUB3 document. Then a, an augmenter takes that EPUB3 and it adds audio. And that audio can either be human narrated or it could be synthesized audio. And then that augmented ebook is output using a reader. 
The research component here centered around, for instance, um, creating the ability, developing the ability to convert complex content, such as graphs and tables, to be able to align them and synthesize them, developing the ability to augment complexly formatted documents uh, with aligned and searchable audio, and the design of a bespoke user interface. And there are two, typically two sets of users for this. One is production users, i.e. publishers and aggregators, and the other is consumer users or your, or your readers. That is just a, a screenshot of the portal that shows you the three different systems, and there's a bit of text that indicates what each does. A lot of work went into developing a bespoke reader. Um, this is a, a big requirement, especially because we are also targeting, for instance, dyslexic users. So the reader interface needed to be able to provide a lot of controls around having different colors for highlighting, different, text, different colors for text, different backgrounds, being able to skip forward or backward in the text. And the main contribution of this system, and which what makes it unique to any other reader or, or, or um, audio book that exists, is that you're able to search within the audio for a word. And that has not existed before. In addition to that, of course, we are able to provide audiobooks, augmented audiobooks, in our local languages now. So in summary, the digital and the humanities is converging. This convergence can be applied to provide um, solutions to social and economic problems. But data is the new commodity. So we have to make sure that we continue to do in parallel, we continue to do data collection to ensure that we make ourselves ready to develop the kind of conversational technologies which are the future of, of language technology. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, a few concluding remarks. With this webinar, we hope we've given you some insight into how technology can enhance our humanness, perhaps. There have been presentations, for instance, on the social network analysis that shows us how we can learn from our interconnectedness. The WordNet's presentation showed us that we can depict information as never before. And the Aweza Med and QFRNC ebooks presentations showed us that language technology can be deployed to help address current socioeconomic problems. But as we've said several times in this presentation, data is the new commodity. And therefore, Sadilor is, is an essential center within the country. And if you'd like to find out more about what's happening at Sadilor, please visit their website. We'd be happy to chat with you at any time. Thank you.